Welcome back to the morning show here on Arise News. Just about a week ago, a coalition of over 200 civil society organizations gave the federal government of Nigeria and President Muhammad Buhari a 14-day ultimatum to show commitment to the rule of law. Addressing newsmen, the leaders of the coalition demanded, among others, the release of the publisher of Sahara Reporters, Mr. Moyele Shoure, and others being held without justification, in their opinion, across the country. According to them, a mass action is inevitable if the government fails to accede to their demands and that the ultimatum began on Tuesday, December 10. Well, it's the seventh day today. And joining us now to discuss these and other issues is Yemi Adamolekun, Director in Office in North Nigeria. Yemi, welcome to The Morning Show. Thank you very much. It's good to see good you here. Only yesterday, you and I were on uh, This Day Live, the uh, Sunday talk show. Now, I mean, a week ago, uh, you were the spokesperson. You read the, uh, statement. the statement issued by the uh, coalition of civil society organizations in Nigeria. And uh, one week after, uh, it looks like uh, the Nigerian government has just ignored the CSOs. And you have five demands, like the uh, protesters of uh, Hong Kong, yeah. you know, very similar. So what, gave, what gives you, know, you the confidence that, uh, in the first place, that the Nigerian government would even pay attention to civil society organizations? And one week after, uh, is there any hope, are you hoping, that the Nigerian government will still uh, take a look at uh, those five demands? Yeah. What is the level of uh, play right now? Well, they actually have, because one of the demands was that they start an investigation into what happened in court that Friday, and they have. Okay. So we we'll take one we'll box. Take, yeah, definitely. We'll definitely take that, and that happened on day two. And you, you think it's a very honest declaration by but the I think Attorney we General must, of the Federation? We must take them at face value. And if they now fail to, um, com to sort of honor their own word, then that's another conversation. But what we asked for was an investigation, and they have responded that they will investigate. The House of Rep is also investigating. The Human Rights Commission has also called for an investigation. So we're quite, we're quite happy with that in that sense. Um, and then, obviously, with, then to follow up, how, how is the investigation going? What's, what did you find? But I think one of the things that's sort of a subtle back to that, um, that we would add to that, is the fact that the Attorney General of the Federation has taken the case from uh, the State Security Service. So could that be a fallout from an investigation that has started and they realize that the SSS cannot be the complainant, the prosecutor in their own case? Maybe. But uh, we definitely take that as a well, win. You, you really believe that the Attorney General is saying that he's taking over the case mm -hmm. uh, amounts to anything. There's Whereas another... in the first place, every case involving the federal government mm -hmm. would need to be approved by the Office well, of the of Attorney course. General. Well, of so is, are you asking the uh, Attorney General to enter a nulla prosecue, you know, because it's not enough to just change the prosecution mm -hmm. team? Well, I, and I think we need to be very clear on, in terms of demands and actions. One of the things this government has been quite terrible at is communication. Um, we've seen that in the response to quite a what happened in the court. Um, first, uh, Femi Adishina issued a statement, then Garbashe issued a statement. So the communication is not a strong suit, but we're also very clear about what our demands are and response. So what we are responding to is the response. Now, what they now do or what that then plays out is a different matter. Femi Falano, who's legal counsel to Shawara, has asked them to actually drop all the charges because there is no case. Mm -hmm. And his point is the fact that the DSS is unable to prosecute the case because there's no case to prosecute. So now that it's gone back to the AGF, as you said, who initially approved it, he's asking the AGF to look, look at the merits of this case and let's have a proper conversation around if there's a case at all. Because we're now in the second week since he was re-arrested and we still don't have any charges. So, it's shocking. Yeah, indeed. To say the least, it is quite shocking. And I'm looking here at the five demands that have been listed out by your um, organization and 199 other CSOs. And... Um, the main two here would be, of course, the unconditional release of Omoyele Shore and then also the release of all illegally detained persons by the DSS over the past few months, majority being journalists from Premium Times, The Punch, etc. And this is a huge problem. A couple of weeks ago, SAM Femi Falana came out to say that over 50 journalists are currently detained 
for absolutely no reason except for their actual right to freedom of expression. Do you really think this government, this serving government of the day, and past governments as well, to be fair, have enough regard for human rights and human rights and the concept of human rights to actually fulfill those particular two demands? Because public opinion suggests that no one is hopeful that the government will come forward, release not only Omoyele Shoare, but over 50 other journalists currently detained for illegal reasons or no reason. But, and I think the important part of that, to your point, is that our demands are not in isolation. Our demands are in, are in the context of a general climate in the country that had a newspaper called very clearly that uh, President Buhari, they will now address him as Major General Buhari retired. And so I think it's important to understand that it's within that context. However, what we have done is just isolate those demands to give the government an opportunity to say that, oh, no, all this is bad press. We're really committed to I mean, we celebrated World Human Rights Day um, on the 10th of, of December. The president, um, uh, Major General Buhari, hasn't sort of spoken to the issue. It's one of the demands that re he reaffirms his commitment to human rights and the rule of law. Because ultimately, if those things are not done, journalists who are detained or citizens who are detained illegally, not released, um, the government not obeying court orders. When those things are asked and then not responded to, the Nigerians need to be very clear mm. the type of government or administration or regime, whatever word you want to use, that we're currently operating. Because it's in that that it becomes very what clear. What I'm saying is, even if we come out and we protest it, yeah. will they still listen? But I think we need to not underestimate the power of citizens. I agree. The dynamic, for, at least from where I sit, is always that citizens have the power. We just need to be clear that we do have that power and use that power. Now, in a country of 100 plus, 100 plus million people, if you do a protest and 10 people show up, or 20 million people, even I would ignore it, quite frankly. But when citizens decide that they realize that whoever is representing them or whoever it is that they've put into office has a duty and an obligation to represent our wishes, yeah. then the dynamics change. So I think for me, the focus in this conversation is not necessarily what the government does or doesn't do, but how citizens choose to respond in exercising their authority as people who have placed them in, in power. Yeah, but what we have before us is that the coalition of uh, civil society organizations, you know, has tried to um, create a platform for that citizen engagement. Yeah and for citizens' uh, protest. Action. Now, you've put five demands out there. Uh, you say, for now, that the CSOs are satisfied with uh, the investigation announced by the Attorney General of the Federation. But then again, you know, if I go back to uh, the Hong Kong situation, mm -hmm. uh, the people of Hong Kong uh, insist that, yes, we want investigation, but it must be an independent investigation. Mm -hmm. In this case, in Nigeria, uh, what is being offered is not an independent investigation. And that was why I asked you earlier whether you really trust government enough mm. uh, to do an investigation and not to just be a case of just, you know, uh, deceiving the public. But at the end of the day, by the expiration of the ultimatum that you have given, if the CSOs do not see any evidence mm. that government is really serious about addressing the core issues, uh, what will happen? Uh, do the CSOs, do they have the capacity to really carry on with their protests and make any impact? Uh, what is the strategy? What is the level of engagement with these citizens that you rely on so much uh, for you to be able to achieve your objective of calling out Nigerian people to say, well, enough is enough? I think, I mean, for me, the framing is extremely important about reliance on or depending on um, yes, it, we're civil society organizations, but ultimately citizens, this is about the citizens. So it, people need to take their calling my phone and say, what is EIA doing about this? What is EIA doing about this? And actually translate that into action. I can't compel anybody to join us, but we will do our bit in mobilizing those who have shown commitment and those who are interested and those who are saying we're tired, we want to do something. Now, strategy is not something to be discussed on a morning show, but I will say this, and we were very clear in our choice of where we were going to do the protest. We didn't choose the National Assembly. We didn't choose Asso Rock because we didn't, we didn't want to compel people to have to come to Abuja to have their voices heard. So we chose the National Human Rights Commission, which has offices in 36 states of the Federation. And we're asking citizens who believe that there's an issue to be addressed to engage the National Human Rights Commission. The National Human Rights Commission, by their enabling act, is meant to defend 
and protect the, the rights of citizens in Nigeria, and they report directly to the presidency. So they are not our, they're not an object of our anger or attack, but they're simply a, an emissary, if you want to use that word. And we're demanding them to do their job and tell the presidency or Major General Buhari's administration that this is unacceptable behavior. We've given five demands. We'll say one out of five have been met. We have four more. And if they're not met by Monday, that's what we will do. And the message to citizens is simply that it's not about CSOs speaking for. CSOs can't. Even if we listed 200 CSOs and you have every staff member of every CSO on, we're spread across Nigeria, there won't be any impact. But CSOs rely on, as you've said, on citizens to come out. But the reliance is not a reliance that can be compelled, but it's a reliance that the, com the compelling factor is the fact that you're dissatisfied. So if you're dissatisfied enough and you think Shoare should not be in jail or any other person who has a family member who's been detained illegally, you have court orders, lawyers, or the family members of lawyers or the clients of lawyers whose court orders are not being obeyed. Everybody has a stake in one way or another where your freedoms are being undermined. Well, yeah, <laughs> yesterday on uh, This Day Live, yes. I told you when you kept referring to President Buhari as mm. Major General Buhari, yes. Uh, the president in 2015 indeed issued a statement mm. to say that he should be addressed as President mm. Muhammad Buhari and Commander in Chief of the Armed Forces. Mm -hmm. But uh, Punch uh, newspaper with their editorial, mm. you know, who seem to have uh, converted you uh, <laughs> to their protest that, uh, you know, what we have is a regime, not an administration, and that the person we have in Abuja is a military dictator. Mm. Uh, not a civilian leader. Uh, you keep insisting on this. Maybe at some point I will have to uh, read out to you, you know, the company policy of Arise <laughs> oh, okay. News. But I'm not a, I'm not a staff <laughs> of Arise. I'm an independent citizen. I'm sitting here in my capacity I'm, as uh, executive director of EA in Nigeria. I'm not a Arise member. Thank you. 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 Thank did issue a statement saying there's absolutely nothing wrong with it because true. it is his title. So he might have issued a statement in 2015. I am, if I want, if we want to talk about, uh, I'm sure there's a word for it, the sort of uh, uh, the more present statement, mm -hmm. if I want to use that word, is of December. Saying there's the Garuba wrong. show said something different. Well, their own confusion internally is their business. I am going to hold Femi Adeshino to his Anyway, <laughs> yeah, me and we'll, we'll go on a short commercial break, and <laughs> when we return, the conversation will continue. It's still the morning show here on Arise News. Welcome back to The Morning Show here on Arise News. Yemi Adamalekun, the executive director of Enough is Enough Nigeria, is still here with us. And we are looking into the fact that today is day seven of the 14-day ultimatum that has been given to the federal government. And I'd like to bring in a point here because although the AGF has come out and responded to this particular matter, a huge point that was raised was that this is a response that did not come in time. And this is one of several issues that last week led the House to move a motion to separate the office of the Attorney General from the Minister of Justice, claiming that at the end of the day, a political appointee from the president serving as the AGF makes matters like this and situations like this with Omoye Lishore, for example, extremely compromising. What is your take on that? I agree. Quite simply. And I think it just allows you to focus on the appropriate office holder for the appropriate matter. And it just, yeah, it the compl uncomplicates matters as the case may be. Mm. Yeah. But do you think that in this particular situation that we're seeing, the only reason that it took the Attorney General of the Federation to respond so late in the day to this particular case was because there was political influence being put on him not to respond? And if that is the case, how does that therefore affect or reflect on this response that we've now had from him that has given that tick off on the ultimatums? Well, I mean, you deal with things as they currently are. Mm. So the ideal is for the offices to be separated, but for the moment that they are not. Yeah, I think, I mean, Chowere's arrest in and of itself is political. Mm. So whatever dynamics are with the State Security Service, um, Major General Buhari's office, the Attorney General's office, all of that dynamic will be political. So without saying, I mean, anything else, I think that will then in, in, in influence how that is handled. But in this particular matter on how him taking back the case, I mean, to your point, he signed off on it. He basically... Um, outsourced the prosecution to a private citizen, so to speak. So he's now saying, okay, fine, we don't, we're not going to use a private citizen anymore. We will now take on the prosecution ourselves. So yeah, um, we'll see how that evolves. 
Well, I mean, let me take you back to this coalition of uh, 200 CSOs. Uh, you know, the 200 civil society organizations on this matter mm -hmm. of the ultimatum to uh, President Buhari. Does that coalition exist in fact and in reality? And if it does, uh, what's the uh, distribution? You know, I need you to disaggregate the composition. Uh, is it nationwide? Or is it uh, just a group of CSOs from southern Nigeria? Mm -hmm. You know, do you have enough numbers also in uh, northern Nigeria? Because, you know, in situations like this, it's possible somewhere down the line to bring ethnicity into it, to well, bring religion, religion into it, for other forces to begin to interplay. Mm -hmm. And then again, in terms of the optics, you know, when the uh, CSOs issued uh, a statement, uh, what we saw on television was the usual group of prominent uh, NGOs. Um, enough is enough, your NGO, uh, Amnesty International, uh, Women and uh, Research uh, Documentation okay. Center, led by Biola uh, 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 that group by uh, uh, our Raspanjani, Sislak, Serap, you know, and a few groups, you know, the yeah, usual, yeah. the usual, <laughs> you know, co-conspirators, you <laughs> know. <laughs> so, I mean, is this a national thing, you know, it's just a group, you know, in one corner saying, well, let us do our own revolution. So, are you guys looking for your own revolution now? Doctor, that's very troublesome. <laughs> Indeed, and he's saying I'm troublesome. Um, <laughs> I think, I mean, the, the press report that picked up on 200 NGOs, I think they picked it up from the Transition Monitoring Group, which is a network of NGOs across the country that has sort of evolved from the 19, return to democracy in 1999, monitoring elections, and has continued to do that um, since over the last 20 years. I think that's where the number came from. But for the people who signed the statement were representatives of those, those organizations. I think what's important is in terms of spread, as I said, we chose the National Human Rights Commission for 36 states. And our focus really was in giving citizens an opportunity to be able to speak their minds on things that have been bubbling up on radio stations. As our organization, for example, we have a radio program in 16 states of the Federation that we have a weekly program. And so citizens are calling in, citizens are complaining. So that, that is the idea. So it's not, you might have your regular faces. And it's also, I would say, also not surprising. Um, for the work that we've done, the work that Ward C has done, the work that um, HEDA has done and TMG has done, it's been over the years and it's been consistent. Sometimes it takes a bit for citizens to connect the dots, but after fighting for return to civil rule or fight for democracy, when you begin to see certain patterns, there is a responsibility that comes with flagging off things very quickly that, look, things are getting really bad and you need to understand why they're bad. Court orders are not being obeyed. People are being illegally detained. A man has gotten bail, not once, but twice. Both times, not obeyed, was obeyed, and less than 24 hours picked up again, and we still don't have charges. So I think there's a responsibility for CSOs who are older in the game, I will say, um, quite frankly, to, to, make, to raise the alarm that there is a challenge. So in terms of spread, yes, across the country, TMG has been across the country for 20 years, so yes. And that's, I mean, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Mm. And another point that came up in this that caused a lot of outrage was Femi Adishin, I believe it was, correct me if I'm wrong, coming out to essentially tell the international community to mind their business mm. on this particular matter. And why it was quite interesting to the ears is because we belong to an international community, right? <laughs> so the statement just didn't necessarily sit well. But what is your take on the fact that that is the response that's coming out from a senior special assistant to the president, on, special advisor, or special yes. advisor, sorry, to the president on don't media and publicity. Don't demote uh, from <laughs> I'm so special sorry. advisor. Special <laughs> advisor on media <laughs> and publicity. Mm. What is your take on that? But I think it's just consistent with um, Major General Buhari's administration's inconsistency with data and information. So I think it was a couple of months ago when they said that um, the World Bank has fake data and most of their data is not grounded in reality, and they're trying to paint Nigeria badly. But the World Bank now said, I think, ease of doing business, we increased on World Bank yeah. rankings, and that became headline news. So I think the parallel of that is also telling international community to mind their business. And as you said, we will show up at international events. We will borrow international money. money. We will ask for international support and aid, but mind your business. So just. Regular inconsistency, I would say. Nothing surprising. Well, Yemi, yeah, I mean, I know you've been involved in this struggle uh, 
to make Nigeria great again for a very long time. And only recently your phone was seized. You were, you know, intimidated by state security tried. officials. Oh, they tried. Okay, they asked you to run you know, and all that. Okay, and they took your phone and they smashed it. Thank God you've replaced the phone. <laughs> but look, with this level of commitment and continued involvement, are you really optimistic that something will change in Nigeria very soon under this administration in terms of the uh, government, you know, changing its attitude, in terms of the government aligning its, itself properly with the expectations of civil society and, if you like, ordinary Nigerians? Or, you know, CSOs, your group, is just doing this uh, just to insist on basic principles. And to remind everyone that no matter what happens, let it just be on record that some people were here who refused to keep quiet. Interesting. I think there's a place for let it be on record that some people refused to keep quiet and chose to use their voice. But I think more fundamentally for me, um, the total number of people who are in elected office or whatever, quite small relative to the larger population of Nigerians. And I just fundamentally believe that Nigerians deserve better, Nigerians want better. And if Nigerians are able to understand that dynamic in terms of power, yes, they have the coercive powers of the state, but the coercive powers of the state can only do so much in the face of citizens who want something different. And we've seen it. I mean, over the course of 10 years that I've been involved with Enough is Enough, I have seen a difference. I've seen a difference in the number of citizens that engage. I've seen a difference in the number of citizens that pay attention to how money is spent, how money is allocated, people who have registered to vote, people who are joining political parties, young people who have run for office, campaigns like Not Too Young to Run, who have brought in new legislators, the youngest speaker, the youngest that's the youngest that. So there are those small wins that I think as we continue to build, and those get more uh, amplified, that people connect the dots between their actions and results. We've seen governors back down. Kwara State is being celebrated, for example, because the governor they didn't only do 35% women, he did, I think, over 50%. Now, um, the governor of Ogun State, for example, promised that his cabinet might have 50% women, but I think it has maybe only two. So in Ogun State today, um, women are protesting. Professor C.D. Osho and uh, Wana Fuakwe. Yes, and even Biola Akinodei for Wati that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. They are camping over at the governor's house overnight till tomorrow and demanding that you promise 30, you even promised over 35%. So you're not even asking for 50 just give the 35%. The CSOs want to appoint commissioners for us in Ogun State. Appoint how? Your governor, when he was campaigning for office, he made a promise. Made a promise. All the women in Ogun are doing are holding him to that promise. And there's nothing, absolutely nothing wrong with that. And, that's, and that, for me, is the power of citizenship. Because everybody who's elected into office must understand that it's the office of the citizen that has the highest power. You might, be, you might have the coercive powers of state, but you must always remember that you owe a responsibility to the citizens who elect you. So when citizens continue to push that demand and make that known and see results in the fact that they own the space, the dynamics have to change because we respond to positive reinforcement at children and adults. At the end of the day, that office of the citizen is the highest office in the land. We are the ones who employ people into government, so it's only right. But I wanted to ask you, the protests will start, or the occupation of the National Human Rights Commissions across the country will start next Monday if yes. these five demands are not met. How long are the protests going to go on for if these demands are still not met? Are we going to see a situation like Hong Kong, where nearly 20 weeks later, or maybe over 20 weeks now, people are still out on the streets protesting, or... Is it going to be something that is minimal but sends a very powerful message across? We'll see. We'll find out on the 23rd. Mm, no, she's asking you, what, what do, should we expect? And I'm saying... You because by now, you, you should be able to plan ahead. We are planning 200 ahead. There's, there's, a, there's two different yeah, things. Can, it, can you give us an well, idea I of choose, what will happen? I choose not to. There are two different things. Planning ahead and revealing your plans are two different things. Okay. So I'm telling you we're planning, mm -hmm. and I'm telling you we'll find out on the 23rd. But the reason, sorry, Dr. Mm -hmm. John, the go reason ahead. I was asking that is because one main concern when it comes to protesting in Nigeria is the fact that there's a general lack of resilience all over the country. Mm -hmm. Whereas we've seen what has been demonstrated in Hong Kong for weeks, one would hope that Nigerians would feel like they could occupy like that to mm -hmm. make a statement or to take a stand. But what is it going to take for us to get there? Because it's seemingly an orientation problem. 
Well, I mean, that's not also a mis not mistake. The Hong Kong protest is not daily. It's scheduled. Mm. There's a very clear schedule. People know when to show up. They do their thing, and everybody goes back to their business. And you show up again on a particular day. So I think that's important to note that it's not continuous. And I think you're right. And mm. the balance also of Hong Kong is higher per capita GPA. Mm. So people are a bit more uh, flexible. Affluent. Yeah. Exactly, affluent. In the framing of our plans that anyway, you find out on the 23rd. We'll, we'll see that framing in due course. And <laughs> thank you very much, Yemi Adamolekon, so Executive Director. Enough is, is enough. enough. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>